All right, here's our project for today, guys. I have this Trollson Reach and Cooler that was donated to me after we installed a new cooler for a customer. They wanted this cooler disposed of, but it's still cooled a little bit. There are some issues with it, but it's still cooled, so I figured I'd bring it back to my shop and do some experimenting on it. Now, I just got the condenser cleaned up. It was plugged pretty bad. It looked like the inside of a mud flap, but uh, it's nice and clean now. As you can see, our compressor doesn't have the original starting components. It's got a hard start on there. So that may skew our amp draw a little bit. That top part there, you'll see a piece of sheet metal that I folded over. There used to be a hole up top where they would store prep items. So I cut the lid off, put that sheet metal over there, um, sealed it with some foam spray. Let's go around to the front here, take a gander at the inside. Now, our right side door, the hinges broke on it, so I just have it screwed in place for now. Left side door, no major issues. Let's get inside here. There's our data tag. Looks like we're working with 134. Now, it is a little bit dirty. I didn't clean the inside. As you can tell, our evaporators kind of smashed down a little bit, so our airflow isn't ideal. And again, these aren't laboratory settings. This is just Bill's garage sort of settings because I'm a curious guy and I want to see what happens when I put non-condensables into a system. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to power the unit on. I'm going to make sure it gets to temperature. I'm going to monitor pressures, amp draw, subcooling, superheat. And then I'm going to add in, I'm not sure exactly how much nitrogen yet, but I'm going to add nitrogen into the system and then let it run again and see how that affects it. I'm pretty sure I'm going to have higher than normal head pressure. My capacity is going to go down. Compressor may shut off and thermal overload. That's what I think is going to happen. But the purpose of this experiment is to see what actually happens. And then once that's done, I'm going to reclaim the nitrogen refrigerant charge and I'm going to take the original refrigerant charge and I'm going to take, I don't know, maybe 30% of that original charge and I'm going to add nitrogen in place of refrigerant and then add the remaining charge in refrigerant. So I'll have the total weight in charge, but it will be a combination of 30% nitrogen, 70% refrigerant. And then we'll see what happens then. I believe what will happen, we'll just have lower than normal capacity. I'm guessing maybe higher than normal head pressure as the non-condensable nitrogen will just fill up space in our condenser. But again, that's the purpose of this experiment is to see what will actually happen. So first things first, guys, I'm going to plug this in right down there. And then we're going to uh, watch the temperatures, pressures, and establish a baseline of operation, all right? We've been running for about 10 minutes. We're down to 55 already. It was close to 70-ish inside that box when we started. Our ambient, 70 degrees in here. Don't mind that scale. We're currently pulling four amps on our compressor with an operating pressure of looks like 94 and 54. Condensing temperature is a little low at 84. I kind of like to see that about 90, 95. Evaporator is 57 degrees, although it's still pretty warm in there. Our condensing temperature should be higher. Our discharge line, our liquid line, 76 degrees. Suction line, 64 degrees. We got a subcooling of 9, superheat of 7.5. This is a cap tube system. So. Let's let that run for a little while. It hasn't been running very long, so I don't want to do too much with the charge yet. Just remember, we are just establishing a baseline right now. Well, we've been running for about 20 minutes now. We're at 32.9 degrees, getting ready to shut off. Amp draw has dropped to 4. It was at 4.1 when we started up. 
Our pressures are 97 over 15. I have a 23 degree superheat, almost a 9 degree subcooling. Let's see, evaporator temperature is 15 degrees. That's about right, 15, 20 degrees. Condensing temperature is 86. That's a little bit low, but I did just clean that condenser. Let's see, suction line temperature 37, discharge line 77. Now that superheat, I'm not really measuring superheat under the best circumstances. I'm just checking my suction line temperature about six inches away from my compressor. And then I'm just taking the suction line pressure right off of there at the service port. Ideally, of course, you wanna measure that inside the box at the outlet of the evaporator but I don't really have that ability in this situation. So it is what it is. This is just for fun. So now what we're gonna do is I'm going to add about maybe four or five ounces of nitrogen into the system. I'm gonna turn it off, add in four or five, or four or five ounces of nitrogen into the system, turn it back on, maybe let the box warm up a little bit so it'll run longer. Then I'm going to turn it back on and we're going to see what happens. All right. All right, guys. So I got my scale zeroed out. I'm going to attach my nitrogen tank to my charging hose. And we're going to do something you're not ever supposed to do in refrigeration, which is introduce non-condensables purposefully into a system. I got four ounces in there. I didn't want to go, actually about three and a half ounces. I didn't want to go any higher than that because my pressures are already at 190-ish. All right, let's plug it in and see what happens. I'm assuming that our compressor will go off on thermal overload almost immediately just because we've added so much gas to it that it won't be able to turn over and pump. All right, we pulled about 19 amps almost immediately. Our compressor is off and it looks like we blew the 20 amp breaker on my extension cord there. All right, so we drew much, much higher amps this time, of course, since we have so much gas in the system. The system is basically overloaded and can't pump. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna reclaim everything out of this system. And then we are going to add in four ounces of nitrogen and then we'll do the rest in refrigerant. So four ounces of nitrogen and eight ounces of R34. So the system isn't overloaded per se. It just has part of it that is not a refrigerant. And then I think that will be a much funner test. This one just shut off on overload almost immediately. That's kind of boring. So let's get this system reclaimed or recovered rather. All right, we got about 15 ounces out of it. Now, to make sure it's completely empty, I'm going to pull a vacuum on it. Let's let this vacuum run for a little bit and we will revisit it in uh, 
about 20-30 minutes when we get down to 500 microns. Here's where we stand guys. We're down to 460 microns, 450 microns rather. And what you probably didn't see was that I did attempt to put in four ounces of nitrogen after our last clip. However, what I found is that when I tried to add four ounces of nitrogen, I could only get about two, two and a half ounces of nitrogen into the system. Before I had so much pressure inside the system, I couldn't get any refrigerant in there. I don't exactly know why that is. I don't know if nitrogen's taking up more space in the system than refrigerant will. But I'm going to modify this part of the experiment a little bit. I'm going to just add in about 25 PSI of nitrogen, which isn't all that scientific because I don't know exactly know how much nitrogen that is. But I'm going to add in about 25 PSI of nitrogen, and then I'm going to see if I can squeeze in 10 ounces of R134A and then operate it. Because I want the system to operate for a while with non-condensables in the system, just so I can see what happens. So, 390, that's pretty darn good. Let me shut this vacuum off, and we'll get to uh, adding some non-condensables in here, all right? And I'm going to add nitrogen until our positive pressure is 25. Just ever so slowly bleeding nitrogen into the system. If we can get it to stabilize and stop right around 20, 25, that should work for this experiment. And we're at 30. So... All right, let's see if we can get 10 ounces of 134 in there. Up to five, six, seven, eight. It's getting there, just about nine. All right, we got 10.2 ounces of 134 in the system on top of 25, 30 PSI of nitrogen. All right, guys, let's plug it in and see what happens. All right, amp draw starting off is about one amp higher than it started off originally, about 1.5 amps higher. Our head pressure is much higher. Our condensing temperature right off the bat is much higher, 145. Let's check out our box temperature inside. We're at 51 and dropping right now. So let's let this run for about five or 10 minutes and see where we stand. It's been about five minutes now. Our temperature isn't dropping as fast as it did originally when we had the actual charge in there. After five minutes, we've dropped almost one degree. Our amp draw has sort of leveled off at about 4.3. Our original amp draw about this time was 4, 4.1. So our amp draw is a little bit higher. Our head pressure is much higher. Our condensing temperature is 150 degrees, even though we have a 72 degree ambient temperature inside my shop here. 
Our evaporator temperature is a little higher than normal. It's about 10 degrees higher than normal. Let's check out our subcooling and superheat. Let's see, liquid line temperature is 71, suction is 63. We have an 81 degree subcooling and a 26 degree superheat. Now the subcooling was something I was really interested in seeing. I wasn't really expecting that high of a subcooling, I suppose, because I thought, my theory anyway, was that the nitrogen would take up more space in the condenser, leaving less space for the refrigerant to actually subcool. So I was expecting a lot lower subcooling with a higher condensing temperature, but that doesn't appear to be the case. And if you'll notice, our temperature is it's gone up about 0.1 degree. All right, guys, we're back after about a five minute break there. Now, as you can tell, our temperature inside the box hasn't changed. And remember that thermometer is in the return air of our evaporator. Our amp draw is about the same. Our head pressure is still high, subcooling is still around 80, superheat is still floating between 25 and 30. My evaporator temperature is 36, condensing temperature is 150, liquid line temperature is 72, suction line temperature is 63. My compressor feels normal, not excessively hot not excessively cool. I'm going to have to do some research onto my higher than normal subcooling because I didn't really expect that, so that's different. However, as you can tell, since our temperature hasn't changed, you can tell that our capacity and ability to cool has gone way down. So if you were to just walk up to this system, customer says it's not cooling, you get there, you check your airflow inside the box, outside the box, the condenser looks clean, so you decide to hook your gauges up and you find higher than normal sub or higher than normal head pressure initially, I would imagine my first thought would be, well, that condensing coil's got to be really plugged up on the inside. Now that condensing coil, let me show you right over here. That condensing coil looks dirty, but I assure you it is clean. There's a little bit of surface grease to it, but when I first got this cooler to my place, I took it outside, soaked it, sprayed it out with the hose. It's very clean. And of course, if it wasn't very clean, we would have noticed that on our initial test. So I can understand how this would be slightly confusing if you just walked up on a system like this and had higher than normal head pressure for no apparent reason. You would, I would just assume that it's either a dirty condensing coil, then I would clean it and have the same symptoms. Then I would assume it's overcharged. So I would pull the charge and I would probably find it's, in this situation I would find that it's close to its original factory charge and then I would probably either be more confused or I might suspect that it had non-condensables in the system. We're still at 50 degrees. Subcooling still high, superheats close to 30. Amp. All right, we've been running for about 15, 20 minutes now. Nothing has changed. Our temperature is not dropping below 50 degrees. Our amp draw is staying the same. Subcooling, superheat, pressures, all that have remained about the same. So we've established a general baseline of what a system or what this system does when it has non-condensables added to it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reclaim this nitrogen refrigerant mixture and then I'm going to add in the factory charge and then we'll power it back on and 
make sure that everything runs as it did before we did our little experiment. We've been running for about five minutes, five, ten minutes. And our temperature went from 51 degrees, we're down to 39 and dropping. Our amp draw is back down to what it was when we originally started, about 4.1. Our condensing pressure is 98, which is close to what it was originally with a condensing temperature of 86. Our ambient temperature hasn't changed. We're still at 71. Our evaporator temperature is still, it's a little low in my opinion. We're shooting for a 34, 35 degree box temperature. So I'd like to see that around 20 degrees at least. But we're at 15 and our, let's see, subcool is 6. Superheat is 41. Liquid line temperature 86. Or excuse me, 80. Our liquid line temperature is 80. Our suction line temperature is 57. Now keep in mind that superheat, don't pay too much attention to that because we're not measuring it under the best circumstances. I'm taking my line temperature near the compressor, about six inches away from the compressor. But I do have air from the condenser blowing over top of that line, so that's going to influence it a little bit. And I'm checking the suction pressure at the suction service tube off of the compressor. So it's not the best. Uh, best case situation would have been checking it directly at the evaporator, but we don't have that ability on this system. Amp draw went down just a little bit. Our temperature is continuing to drop at 36 degrees, 35. So it looks like we are back into normal operating ranges. Or it looks like we are back into normal operating conditions, rather. All right, guys, here's a, a little compilation of all the data that I jotted down from this little experiment. As you can tell, on the uh, left-hand side in the green is our normal, our baseline of operation, if you will. Compressor amp draw, 4.2, liquid line, 78, suction line, 35, superheat, 20, subcool, 8.1, with overall operating pressures of 97 over 15. And that data I recorded when we were about 35 degrees inside that box. And then in the middle, you'll see the part of our experiment where we just added approximately three or four ounces of nitrogen into the system on top of the already, already there factory charge. And I was really expecting it to do what it did. It just went off on uh, its thermal overload and then it tripped my breaker on the extension cord. I can't say that I was surprised by that. And then on the end there, we have the part of the experiment where we just added 25 PSI and nitrogen and then added in 10 ounces of 134A. Um, as you can tell, we had a compressor amp draw 4.8. Liquid line went down a little bit. It was 72. Suction line temperature went up. It was 63. Superheat was close to what it uh, was supposed to be, 25 to 30. Subcool was outrageous at uh, 80 degrees of subcooling with uh, overall operating pressures of 269 over 31. Now, I expected higher than normal head pressure, the 269. I didn't expect higher than normal subcooling, so I'm a little confused as to why I have such high subcooling. Now, since our nitrogen was taking up space in our condenser, I don't believe we could reject as much heat as we needed to Therefore, our refrigerant could ab couldn't absorb as much heat as it needed to, so our suction line temperature was higher, and our liquid line temperature was a little bit lower. Or maybe our liquid line temperature was lower because, partially because our subcool was so high. See, that's the part that has me confused, is our subcooling being so high. So if you guys are watching this, throw me some comments. Let me know what you think about this. I'm going to read up on it and uh, 
see if I can formulate a better hypothesis of why my subcooling was so high and why my liquid line was uh, lower than normal. All right, guys, that does it for today's video. I hope you got a kick out of this little experiment. It was uh, fun for me, so I hope it was fun for you as well. Hope you learned a little bit of something anyway. I know I did. So if anybody out there has any uh, tips, ideas, suggestions, comments, please leave them below. I'm curious to see what you guys think of this little experiment. If you guys maybe see something that I could have done differently or should have done differently, let me know. If you guys know why my subcooling was so high, let me know. I have my reasons or ideas what I think caused my subcooling to be so high, but I'm curious to know what you guys think. So yeah, put your comments below. I'll get to them. And uh, for now, like and subscribe, guys. We'll see you on the next one, all right? Thanks for watching. I appreciate it.